Kelsey. Uh, so my name is Dr. Junie Quay. I'm a consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, Honorary Senior Clinical Research Fellow at the UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology in London, England. And I'm very grateful to the European Federation of Autonomic Societies and Mission MSA for recognising this work uh, with the Alpha Senuclean Award in 2024. So I'm going to start this talk by giving an introduction to the autonomic nervous system, what happens when it goes wrong, what are the potential causes of autonomic failure, and alpha synucleinopathies, of which our, uh, MSA is one of them, and then talk about what are the uh, key questions in this field that we hope this research study will be able to answer. So to start off with, I'd like you to think back to how you got out of bed and how you woke up this morning, um, because uh, this is an illustration of how the autonomic nervous system is always working in the background to keep all the or different organs in the body ticking over without our conscious control. So um, if you had a good night's sleep um, and this morning you woke up and bounced out of bed, um, gravity would act to cause the blood within your blood vessels to tend to pull towards uh, the bottom of your legs and the autonomic nervous system um, acts to compensate for this by squeezing together your blood vessels um, and causing the heart to beat a little bit faster to maintain your blood pressure and blood flowing to your brain so that you can continue to think clearly and go about your normal activities. If your autonomic nervous system was not doing this, you might have symptoms of orthostatic intolerance, which are symptoms like feeling lightheaded, dizzy, that you can't think properly, see properly or hear properly, or um, you might develop pain in the neck and shoulders um, called coat hanger pain. And if symptoms get really severe and there's not enough blood going to the brain at all, um, you might pass out or faint. Um, and this part of the autonomic nervous system is the part that's looking after cardiovascular function, so the blood pressure and heart rate in particular. But it is actually responsible for looking after all the different organs in the body. So if you then got out of bed and went on to eat your breakfast, your salivary glands would be automatically producing saliva um, without you thinking about it. And then as you chew and then swallow the food, um, the food is pushed down through the gut until it's ready to go out the other end. Again, um, without you thinking about it, moving along the digestive tract. It's all done under the conscious, unconscious control of these um, neural networks um, in the body uh, that make up the autonomic nervous system. So what are the potential causes of autonomic failure? Worldwide, one of the most common causes is uh, diabetes, um, where the autonomic peripheral nerves are affected over time, particularly if there's poor control of diabetes. But there are also a number of other different causes. So there's a genetic disease called transthyretin amyloidosis that you can identify with a genetic test, and it's treatable with genetic therapies. So something important not to miss when someone presents with autonomic failure. There are autoimmune causes like autoimmune autonomic ganglionopathy, where the body produces an antibody against the autonomic receptors, um, causing a severe widespread autonomic failure as a result. And again, an important one not to miss because it's treatable and potentially reversible if you give treatments to modify the immune uh, system um, in the body. And then there's a group of conditions um, that I don't really need to introduce to you so well in this audience, um, which we put under the sort of neurodegenerative category, and MSA is one of these diseases. So speaking a little bit more about alpha synucleinopathies, um, so these are neurodegenerative diseases characterized pathologically by the deposition of abnormal alpha synuclein um, within different parts of the central and peripheral nervous system. So this is this group of conditions includes MSA, Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, and a rarer condition known as pure autonomic failure. 
So the figure on the left illustrates all the different structures within the brain, spinal cord and peripheral nervous system where um, alpha-synuclein is found in MSA. Um, and in contrast to MSA and PD and DLB, in pure autonomic failure, uh, the deposition of alpha-synuclein is largely peripheral. So it's found within the autonomic ganglia and the spinal cord and the peripheral autonomic nerves. And consequently, patients with pure autonomic failure tend to present with gradually progressive autonomic failure in the absence of the other neurological features that you would see in MSA, like a tremor or problems with coordination um, that you see in MSA and PD, for example. Um, so what are the challenges in the field um, for uh, clinicians and patients with autonomic failure? So first of all, uh, when uh, patients first present early in the stages of in the early stage of the disease, um, there may be unusual features um, that suggest um, one disease uh, pathogenesis um, and uh, or multiple different pathogenesis, um, and it's not clear what the cause is. And we know also that um, a third of individuals with pure autonomic failure. Um, who present with isolated autonomic failure with no other features, like I mentioned before, later on when you follow them up over time, develop features like tremor or coordination problems, and we call this phenoconversion to MSA or PD. So what is really needed in the field is an early, minimally invasive biomarker to confirm the presence of an alpha-synuclein and capture prodromal MSA or PD. This will help to facilitate early recruitment to clinical trials for disease-modifying treatment in keeping with the aim for mission MSA to lead the charge to cure multiple system atrophy. So the key questions we wanted to answer from this research were whether cutaneous phosphorylated alpha synuclein or PSIN for short, was able to distinguish between PAF, MSA, and non-synucleinopathy-related autonomic failure, and whether cutaneous PSIN was associated um, with markers of cardiovascular autonomic failure that we can measure in an autonomic laboratory. So this was how we conducted the study. We recruited patients from a national autonomic unit um, at Queen Square over a three-year period with PF, PAF, MSA, and non-synuclinopathy-related autonomic failure. Um, all patients had um, a variety of autonomic function tests uh, that are routinely performed in our centre, including head up tilt, deep breathing, the Valsalva maneuver, and measurement of blood markers uh, of noradrenaline and adrenaline. Um, and they also all filled out a questionnaire uh, to document the severity of their autonomic symptoms across a number of domains listed there, uh, ranging from um, their symptoms when they were upright um, through to uh, problems with sweating, uh, their bladder, their bowels, and their pupils. And all patients had uh, punched skin biopsies collected on their local anesthetic from their distal leg just above the ankle um, on both sides. And the patients will all follow up until the end of the study in 2023 uh, to look for if amongst the PAF patients, um, whether any of them developed any additional features to suggest a more widespread synuclinopathy. The skin biopsies uh, were cut into very, very thin sections using a freezing microtome and processed with indirect immunofluorescence. So with this technique, we incubate uh, the slices of skin um, with a panel of primary antibodies initially, which bind to the structures of interest within the skin and then wash out these primary antibodies. We then apply uh, a panel of secondary antibodies that bind to the primary antibodies and are attached to a fluorescent tag um, that then allows us to visualize the structures when we use um, a special microscope um, to then visualize all the different structures of the skin. Um, so 
we also developed um, a simple way to quantify how much synuclein we were visualizing in each sample. So firstly, um, we looked at the autonomic structures in the skin. So these are blood vessels, sweat glands, and erector pili muscles that are the base of the um, hair cells um, within the skin and act to um, raise the hairs when you're cold or scared. And if uh, synuclein was visualized in a blood vessel in any uh, section from a sample, we would give it a score of one. If it, if PSIN was visualized within all of these three structures within a single biopsy, um, we gave that an autonomic PSIN subscore of three. And then we looked at all the other structures in the skin, including the dermal nerve bundles, the subepidermal neural plexus, and isolated fibers in the upper dermis, and all in all, giving it a total uh, PSIN subscore, uh, PSIN score of six. Um, for um, each biopsy. So we recruited 11 individuals with isolated autonomic failure that were followed up over time. Uh, four of them had atypical features that led to the consideration of a possible diagnosis of an autoimmune autonomic failure, and they were given actually immune therapy, but with no response and continued to progress, and later on developed other features like REM sleep behavior disorder, um, that were more in keeping with the diagnosis of PAF. We recruited 15 individuals with atypical Parkinsonism or cerebellar features with autonomic dysfunction, 13 of whom later had a diagnosis of MSA, and two had a diagnosis of another uh, neurodegenerative disorder associated with tau rather than synuclein called progressive supranuclear palsy. And we had another 10 individuals um, with autoimmune autonomic failure, um, hereditary transthyretin amyloidosis, which I mentioned before, and another patient um, who developed problems after chemotherapy that formed a total of 12 non synuclinopathy related autonomic failure um, patients. So what did their skin biopsies show? So in the pure autonomic failure group, Every single biopsy we collected had um, synuclein visualized, and most often it was very abundant, as you can see in um, those pictures on the right. Um, in the non synuclinopathy group, um, in contrast, all the samples we collected um, were negative. Um, so every single one of those biopsies were negative for synuclein. And in the MSA group, it was a mixed picture. So when we looked at the biopsies, 73% of them were negative. And because each patient had um, two samples collected, one from either leg, um, in total, 92% of the MSA patients had at least one biopsy, uh, which was positive for synuclein. Um, when we looked at the score that I mentioned earlier, um, the total piece in score um, and the autonomic piece in subscore. Um, this varied uh, significantly between the PAF group and was much uh, and the MSA group and was much higher in the PAF group compared to the MSA group. Um, when we were trying to distinguish between PAF and non synuclinopathy related failure, just the presence of PSIN was enough to distinguish the two groups with 100% sensitivity and specificity. Um, and if they had abundant synuclein, so with a cutoff of a total PSIN score greater than three, that was able to distinguish PAF from MSA with 100% specificity and 82% sensitivity. So, very, very, very sensitive and specific tests. Um, and we think that PSIN may be of particular interest as an early diagnostic biomarker in patients with atypical features. So going through these in more detail, we recruited four individuals who had initially developed symptoms in their 40s with severe autonomic failure, but without any of the other movement disorders um, that we see um, that might have suggested um, a, a diagnosis like MSA. Um, and these patients were given a diagnosis of potential autoimmune autonomic failure, had trials of immunotherapy, but with no response and continued to progress. 
and um, some also developed REM sleep behavior disorder. And in four of these patients, the biopsies were actually collected before they developed um, the REM sleep behavior disorder or other features that suggested PAF, um, suggesting that uh, PSIN may be of value um, early on in the disease course. Um, and the other uh, area of interest was I discussed that we followed up patients over time um, and in the patient that presented with isolated autonomic failure with the lowest PSIN score um, at recruitment to the study, um, that patient actually, um, after two years, developed uh, cognitive problems um, and with formal neuropsychometry that was in keeping with evolving dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, another patient who had a moderate, um, low uh, score of 3.5 uh, at initial recruitment, um, had follow-up biopsies collected after a year that showed a very low piece in score of one, and after two years developed movement problems and scans that were consistent with a diagnosis of MSA. So these uh, cases uh, suggest that uh, in a an individual presenting with isolated autonomic failure, um, an unexpectedly low PSIN score might be suggestive of uh, a more central synuclonopathy that may be emerging in the future. And our second question, our second research question, was whether autonomic PSIN correlated with the severity of autonomic failure. Uh, so we performed a number of different assessments of uh, the function of the autonomic nervous system, including head up tilt and the Valsalva maneuver, and calculated various parameters um, that helped us um, to identify which parts of the autonomic nervous system were impaired in these individuals. And what we found were that there was a significant correlation um, between autonomic synuclein deposition um, and markers of cardiovascular autonomic failure that we measured on these tests that were affected by the autonomic control of total peripheral resistance. Um, so this, these included measures like the degree of fall in systolic blood pressure on head up tilt, the orthostatic intolerance ratio, which is the change in systolic blood pressure over the time tolerated in tilt, and the pressure recovery time, the time taken in seconds uh, for the blood pressure to recover after an individual has performed the Valsalva maneuver. And the autonomic piece in subscore also correlated with um, the symptoms of orthostatic intolerance reported by patients on that subscore uh, on, on the uh, Compass 31 autonomic questionnaire. Um, so in conclusion, um, cutaneous PSIN is abundant in pure autonomic failure, a predominantly peripheral alpha synuclinopathy. It's a promising early minimally invasive diagnostic biomarker to help distinguish between PAF, MSA, and non-synuclinopathy related autonomic failure with excellent sensitivity and specificity. And we think it will be particularly useful in atypical cases early on where there is diagnostic uncertainty and low PSIN in individuals presenting with isolated autonomic failure is a potential red flag for more widespread uh, central alpha synuclinopathy such as in the vein. And we also found evidence to suggest that PSIN deposition on autonomic nerves may impair the control of total peripheral resistance, giving rise to symptomatic orthostatic hypertension. So I'd like to um, just acknowledge my PhD supervisors, um, Dr. Valeria Iodice and Professor Michael Lunn, and all my wonderful colleagues um, at the Autonomic Unit at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, uh, Professor Maria Milano, who runs the Skin Biopsy Laboratory in Italy, and all her wonderful team who taught me these techniques, uh, the Guarantees of Brain who funded my PhD research, um, my department, uh, the Department of Brain Repair and Rehabilitation um, at the UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology, 
who kindly provided me a travel grant um, to be able to perform this research in Italy. And of course, the European Federation of Autonomic Societies and Mission MSA for recognizing this work and all our patients who selflessly volunteered uh, to participate in the study. Thank you very much.